uh, be looking at Samuel. I mean, um, here in our English Bibles and in most of the modern Bibles, you will have Samuel divided into two parts, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. But then originally when the book of Samuel was written, it was written as one single unified book. And then um, later when they were trying to translate this Hebrew, uh, you know, um, Samuel into the Greek language, um, the Greek alphabets were taking more space. So they realized that they're not able to fit the entire book of Samuel into one single scroll. So that, that was the time when they decided, you know, in the Septuagint, the Septuagint is your Greek translation of the Hebrew original Bible. So when they were doing the translation into the Greek Septuagint, at that time they divided the book of Samuel into uh, the first and the second uh, Samuel uh, so that they can put them on two separate scrolls because it was difficult to fit the entire uh, thing onto one single scroll. That's basically how we have now ended up with 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Um, a little bit about how this book was compiled. Um, if we could have, you know, uh, someone go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 29, uh, there we get a little idea of who was writing down the records and maintaining, you know, a list of all the events and things like that. So if we could have someone read out for us, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29, please. As for the events of King David's region, from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel, the Sheer, the records of Nathan, the prophet, not the seed. From uh, this verse, we get to know that there were at least three persons writing down and keeping a written record of all the events which were taking place. So Samuel, of course, was maintaining a written record. We also get to know that Nathan, the prophet, uh, who was there in the time of David, he too was maintaining a record of the different events which were taking place. And you also have Gad the seer. He too is um, maintaining some of the uh, records of the events which were taking place. So at some point of time, all of these uh, written records would have been brought together. And then under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were uh, the they would have selected which portions to include in the final book of Samuel. So um, most probably this would have taken place um, maybe before the Israelites went into exile to Babylon. So approximately in 6th century BC, that is when the final compilation of the book of Samuel and the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles would have taken place. Uh, definitely before they go into the uh, exile. Around that time, they would have done the final compilation of these three uh, books. So uh, let's look at the situation in this book of Samuel. Where does the story begin? Uh, we see that this uh, begins to record the events which take place after the time of Judges. So the time of Judges is now over and uh, what God had planned for the nation of Israel has not really taken place because we see in the time of Judges um, that the people fail to conquer all the land which was you know, actually given to them by the Lord. In fact, they lose a lot of that land because uh, you constantly have different foreigners coming and attacking them and taking away land from them. So rather than actually achieving what God wanted for them, they in fact lose out on a lot of land during the time of the judges. And during this time, you know, when the book of Samuel is beginning, we see that there's a new group which has come onto the scene. In the same way the Israelites entered into the land of uh, Canaan, you have an other people group also entering into this land known as the Philistines. And these Philistines gain power. They are uh, quite a warrior group you know, very skilled in uh, battle. And uh, so they start taking over a lot of this entire uh, land of Canaan. And uh, the Israelites are unable to deal with them. And moreover, we see that at this point of time, there's no proper leadership. 
the judges were there uh, all for temporary periods of time uh, for a little while they were able to you know um, gain regain some of the land and maintain peace for a few years uh, but there was no proper leader as such so that's basically the situation that we see now even when we come to spiritual matters there's not uh, there's no proper spiritual leadership seen at this point of time because at Shiloh that's basically where the tabernacle has been placed so um, in Shiloh you have uh, the high priest Eli and Eli is now by now a, quite an old man uh, in fact he's so aged that he has lost his eyesight he cannot even see so Eli is this old high priest at that point of time and um, he is not a very strong personality, does not take any effort to maintain spiritual discipline in the land or in fact even in the tabernacle. So which is why his two sons do whatever they want. And Eli does not try to discipline them or try to correct them in any way. So you, we see that Eli's two sons are doing whatever they want in the tabernacle. So politically there's no proper leadership spiritually there is no leadership to you know guide the land and into this kind of a situation samuel steps in um, you know as a little boy he's brought over there by his mother to the tabernacle so uh, from the age of 3 or 4 years he starts growing up in the tabernacle and he is the new leadership i mean uh, this little child who has come over there he is going to grow up into a person who will provide some kind of political leadership to the land and also spiritual, definitely a very clear spiritual, you know, uh, mentorship for the people. So, um, so during the time of Eli, God does not even bother speaking because Eli is, has not been very, very committed or obedient. And now when Samuel begins to grow, that is when God begins to speak again because now finally there is a person who is willing to hear what the Lord has to say and also practice what the Lord is saying. Because the Lord is not interested in people who are just hearers. He wants us to be doers. So once um, Samuel comes into the picture, the Lord once again begins to communicate uh, with the people. So we see in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, it says that during the time of Eli, you know, the word of the Lord was rare. The Lord hardly ever spoke or conveyed any message to the people. And it says visions were very, very few. I mean, uh, the, lead, the spiritual leaders were not given any visions to convey to the people. So things were in that state. And then when Samuel comes, he finally is able to provide some kind of good leadership. And um, if we could have someone read out for us, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 to 17. 1 Samuel 7, 15 to 17. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Rehama, where his home was. And there he also judged Israel, and the build, and he built an altar there to the Lord. So, if we were to look at verse fifteen, it clearly refers to Samuel as a judge. So, in a way, we can say that the last judge for the land of Israel at that point of time was Samuel. Samuel was the last judge, and he was also uh, a prophet. So, as a judge, as the leader of these people, he holds you know, his court in four different places. He travels throughout the year. For some time, he stays in Bethel. And then for the next section of the year, he stays in Gilgal. From there, he moves to Mizpah. And finally, you know, he comes back to Rama, which is actually his home uh, town. So in, in these four places, uh, while he's staying over there, people would come to him with their civil cases, their criminal cases. And then he would uh, pass judgment you know, uh, after consulting the Lord. So that's basically what he did as a leader in these different places. 
but of course he was also the prophet a man with whom god communicated and through whom god would be able to convey his messages to the people so um, maybe we can look at one verse which talks about his uh, you know his position as a uh, spiritual leader uh, 1 samuel chapter 3 verses 19 to 21 and it's talking about a time when samuel is still quite a young man and this is what those verses say about samuel at that point of time 1 samuel 3 19 to 21 please the lord was with samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground and all israel from dan to bersheba recognized that samuel was attested as the as a prophet of the lord the lord continued to appear at shiloh and there be and there he revealed himself to samuel through his word so now for almost 450 years 500 years um people have not really experienced the hand of god no proper leader no one to guide them there's been a kind of uh, spiritual famine in that land and now finally you know samuel is over here and it says that this man was so faithful to the lord that the lord would not allow any of his words to fall to the ground so if samuel said something would happen it would happen god would see to it that what samuel is proclaiming will come to pass so the lord um backed up samuel and showed that samuel has got his full approval and that is why it says that all of israel from dan up to bersheba they all began to recognize that this samuel is definitely a prophet of the lord and the lord would keep appearing to him at shiloh and the lord would keep revealing himself to samuel through his word and uh, so samuel is the one who starts trying to bring the people back to the lord because during the time of the judges they had all gone off into idolatry and so now we see samuel bringing a change in the land uh, maybe we could read out that first samuel chapter 7 verses 3 to 4 first samuel 7 3 to 4 then samuel spoke to all the house of israel saying if you return to the lord with all hearts then put away the foreign gods and the astrods from among you and prepare the hearts for the lord and serve him only and he will deliver you from the land of philippi philippines so the children of israel put away the bells and the astrods and serve the lord only it says in the last portion of this verse 4 and they served the lord only this was like a new experience for them for almost 500 years they had just been living uh, you know uh, in idol worship but now finally under the leadership which samuel has now brought now finally they put away those idols and they begin to serve yahweh only so we see this great change which has now come into the land and uh, during the time of judges this uh, there's something which a phrase which was repeated again and again for you know four times in fact we see in the book of judges a particular phrase being mentioned uh, it's found in judges 17:6 in judges 18:1 in judges 19:1 and then uh, uh, finally at the very end of the book of judges the very last verse of the book of judges you know judges 21:25 what is this what is this phrase maybe we could read it out judges chapter 17 verse 6 if someone could read out judges 7 17 verse 6 in those days there were no king in israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes so whatever the people felt like doing they did because there was no leader to counsel them order them control them you know and and maintain some kind of spiritual discipline as because there was no leadership there was no king the people did whatever they felt like doing and now you know in in that uh, kind of a place we see discipline coming in but then in first samuel chapter 4 um this is when you know samuel is still a young uh, man and at that time uh, the eli's uh, sons this is what they do you know when the philistines attack so in first samuel chapter 
um, we see the Yahweh presenting himself as the king of the people. So in 1 Samuel chapter 4, we read that the Philistines attack uh, the Israelites. And uh, so the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they decide that if they were to take the ark of the Lord into the battle, you know, then God would feel obliged to fight on their behalf. But then because Hophni and Phinehas are uh, not at all faithful to the living God, the Lord is really not under any obligation to, uh, you know, help them or assist, assist them. And so even though they take the ark of the Lord into the battlefield, the Philistines win. And we are, we are familiar with the story. Uh, you know, the Philistines are very happy. In fact, when they, when they hear that the ark of the Lord has come into the battlefield, it says that they were scared. They were afraid because they had heard many stories about this Yahweh. And so they were worried what would happen to them. And so they, with all their might, they tried to fight. And of course, you know, the Lord allows them to have victory because he is not supporting uh, Phinehas and Hophni. And uh, so... Uh, you know, the Israelites are defeated and the Philistines are very happy and they take the Ark of the Covenant and they take it back to one of their, uh, you know, main centers, Ashdod. So they take the Ark back to Ashdod and over there, they, they have the temple of uh, Dagon. Dagon is their chief primary uh, idol. So they take the Ark and they place it over there in the temple of Dagon. And then we see what happens. Um, on three days, uh, on the first day and the second day, and then on the days which follow, Yahweh proves that, yes, his people have been defeated due to their sinfulness, but it doesn't change the fact that he is still Almighty King. So he proves his complete sovereignty. You know, during the time of the judges, the people lived as they wished because there was no physical uh, human king ruling over them. But the Lord wanted to show that, yes, the people, uh, his people have been defeated, but he is still almighty king. And so um, in the culture of those times, in that ancient culture, if a certain nation is able to uh, gain victory over another nation, it's supposed to prove that the gods of this nation, this victorious nation, definitely must be more powerful than the gods of the defeated nation. So the Philistines take the ark and go back to Ashdod with the belief in their mind that their Philistine gods are superior to this Yahweh. And so with that great pride, they place this ark of the covenant in their temple. You know, like as if they are saying to Dagon, here, Dagon, another one of the gods have come to you. You uh, Even this god has now you know, bowed down to you. So with that attitude, they place the ark over there. But then the next day when they come over there to the temple, they see that this Dagon has fallen down flat in front of the ark. As though Dagon is paying you know, homage to Yahweh. And they are quite surprised to see you know, the, this huge statue fallen down flat like that in front of the ark. And so they lift it up, they, you know, they, they set it aright once again. But then on the next day when they come back, now there's another symbol. The hands and the head of the idol are, you know, have been cut off. It's exactly the way, you know, you know um, it used to happen in their uh, military conquests. When a king is defeated, you know, the, the victorious king has the right to cut off his head and cut off his hands to declare that complete victory has been established over this enemy. And so now the God of these Philistines has been reduced by Yahweh and his head and his hands have been cut off by the living God. So this must have proved to the Philistines that even though the Israelites have lost, their God most definitely has not lost. And after that, you know, in the, over the next few days, there's a plague which breaks out in Ashdod and, on, and in all the surrounding cities where um, the people are attacked by tumors and boils and um, their health completely deteriorates. And now the people are terrified. The Philistines are scared.
because they realize that this god is not like any of the other human gods that they have been used to and so they realize that this is a living god that they cannot play with and so just like in the you know like you like in the case of a military conquest they offer tribute to this king of kings you know like in a, when, when there's a battle and you have the victorious king who you know rises up victorious the one who has is who is defeated will offer a tribute of money and gold um, you know and maybe cattle and all of that to the victorious king and here you have the philistines offering gold to yahweh as a tribute and then after that what do we see we see the victorious king coming back to his land did the philistines bring the ark back no they just put it on the ah uh, on the cart and the and the cattle know exactly where to come how to come you know nobody showed them a map and told them you know this is the direction you should go to go back to israel because the almighty king who is in charge knows how to bring his presence back to israel and so the ark on its own you know uh, without any help uh, is able to come back uh, with the cattle bringing it back to israel so this story is mentioned right there in what uh, the beginning of the uh, of the book of first samuel to show and declare to us who is the king of israel yes the judges were poor leaders um, but the true king of israel has always been yahweh yahweh is the king of kings and lord of lords he is the one who is ultimately king over this entire you know nation but the people don't quite realize that they don't quite recognize that and so when samuel becomes an old man and his sons are given the leadership uh the people come to him and they say we don't want your sons to be leaders because they are like you know that previous uh, bunch hopni and pinehas in the same way hopni and pinehas had no fear, fear and respect for the lord samuel's sons also do not have any fear or respect for the lord in fact they have been taking bribes and they have been you know uh, perverting justice they have been uh, doing all kinds of evil things in the sight of god one thing that we really seem to notice again and again in the old testament is that these men of god had very poor parenting skills i mean they were really bad parents they made no effort whatsoever to bring up their children in the ways of god i really do not know why they were like that but that's a you know a warning which we should really take to heart we should never be i mean we of the new testament should never be like these old testament men of god who did great things but when it came to parenting pathetic parenting never even bothered to teach their children the ways of god and bring them up in the ways of god so they neglected something very important so you know these um, sons of samuel he is he has now made them the leaders and they do not even know how to behave as leaders they are ill treating the people taking bribes and you know um, giving um, giving giving the court decision to the wrong person by taking money by taking bribes so there's a lot of evil going on and so the people come to samuel and they say um maybe we could read out that that would be first samuel chapter 8 verse 5 first samuel chapter 8 verse 5 they said to him you are hold and your sons do not walk in your ways now appoint a king to lead us such all the other nations have um okay maybe we can also read verses 6 and 7 yeah but when they said give us a king to lead us this displeased samuel so he prayed to the lord and the lord told him listen to all that the people are saying to you it is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king so um when the people say now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have all the other nations have human kings we too want to have a human king who can lead us when they say this samuel is offended because they are rejecting his sons they are basically rejecting him so he's displeased and he goes and prays to the lord 
to ask the Lord for justice. And the Lord says, it's not you that they are rejecting. They're literally rejecting me because I am the king. The Lord proved to all of them in 1 Samuel 4 that he is very much the king of the land of Israel. But the people, you know, they do not want Yahweh as the king. They want a human king. And uh, so the Lord says to Samuel, it is me that they are rejecting. And the Lord is not happy with what they have asked for. Now, keeping this in mind, if we could also look at uh, what the Lord had said much earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. Let's look at that, where God actually talks about kings and kingship. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 and 15. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving to you, and have taken possession of it and settled it in, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not a brother Israelite. So even before they entered into the promised land, the Lord said, one day, you know, you will go. You will enter into the promised land. And, the, and at that time, you will ask for a king. But over here, the Lord does not say, I don't know. I don't want you to have a king. I forbid you from ever asking for a king. That is not what God says over here. The Lord says, when you, when you ask that, please make sure that you appoint a person from among your own people. Don't appoint a foreigner. So here the Lord is not displeased with the idea of a king. He's open to the idea. In fact, he says to them, this is how I want you to choose your king. Choose someone who is an Israelite. And he also goes on to give some other criteria which you know, they should observe while appointing a king for themselves. The Lord is not against the idea of the people having a king. So why is he so upset over here in 1 Samuel chapter 8? when the people ask for a king. Um, this is God's purpose for a human king. The reason why God wanted to have a human king is so that the king can be his representative. So that the king will do exactly what God wants done. So the Lord will give his instructions and commands to the king and the king will then implement them on behalf of Yahweh. So the Lord wanted a human representative who will represent him ac accurately in front of the people, you know, which is what the Lord originally wanted. So these are the instructions which the Lord gives in Deuteronomy 17 about what kind of a king they should choose. These are some of the things which the Lord, you know, says in Deuteronomy 17, um, uh, verses 16 to 20. We see some things which the Lord specifically lays down, some criteria. The Lord says, the king should not be a person who will acquire a great number of horses. Second, the Lord also says in verse 17, you know, Deuteronomy 17, 17, uh, it should be a person who will not take many wives. Third, the Lord says in the same verse, it should not be a person who will want to accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. And the fourth uh, condition which the Lord lays down is that this king should be a person who will write down a, you know, on a scroll a copy of the entire law of Moses which the Lord has given. So this man, this king, is supposed to read it all the days of his life. Every day he's supposed to read that and he is to follow carefully all the words of this law. And he must be careful not to turn from the Lord, from the law to the right or to the left. So the Lord asks, the Lord says, when you choose a king, this is the kind of king I have in mind. This is the kind of king who should be appointed. So the Lord is not against a king. The Lord is just saying, choose a king who will be a true representative of me, who will follow what I am telling and who will give you the, you know, who, who, will, who will run the nation in, the, in a way which I approve of. And David, in fact, when he comes to the throne later, he actually understands this concept. 
and in the, at least in his initial years he is very careful to follow these criteria because you know if you if you remember the very popular verse which we are all familiar with uh, maybe we could read it out psalm 20 verses 6 to 8 if someone could read out psalm 20 verses 6 to 8 Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He answers him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their kings and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Oh Lord. Yeah. So over here, if you look at these verses, uh, David, you know, he says, the Lord is the one who gives victory to his anointed, to the anointed king. It's the Lord who gives the victory. It's not the chariots or the horses which bring the victory. And so he says over here, some, that, you know, some kings and some people trust in chariots and some of them trust in horses. But we, we trust in the name of the Lord our God because it's the Lord who will give us victory. So he was very, very clear about that. And he didn't, he didn't just simply sing the psalm whenever, you know, he felt like singing. Because we tend to do that. When we are standing in the church, we lift up our hands and we sing all the right words. But when we come back home, uh, you know, from the church, we do what we want and we may not actually implement what we sang. But here we see David actually practicing what he sings. Um, so let's look at a couple of verses. Second Samuel chapter 8 verses 3 and 4. 2 Samuel 8, 3 and 4. David also defeated Hagezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Joba, as he went to recover his te uh, territory at the river of Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also David hamstrung all the ch chariot horses except the spade enough of them for 100 chariots. We see over here that when David defeats this king uh, Hadadazer, he is able to capture 1,000 chariots. That's a lot of chariots. So which basically means that you know each chariot would probably have maybe uh, two horses or maybe three horses attached. So that's a lot of horses which he's able to acquire. 1,000 chariots, each chariot being pulled by at least two horses may or maybe more. And so now he's gained a whole bunch of horses. But what does he do? It says in the next verse that he hamstrung all of the horses except and kept only 100 of them. Hamstringing is basically where you uh, cut a particular uh, you know, nerve, uh, a vein in the in the in the leg of the horse. So once that particular vein or nerve is cut, uh, the animal is not able to um, run fast and perform well in the battle. Why does David do that? Because the Lord's instruction had been, my king will not depend on himself or his chariots or horses. My king, the one who represents me, will depend upon me. He will only be my human representative. That is why David is so careful, you know, that he um, does not hold on to those horses. He hamstrings them so that they will no longer be used in battle. And he only keeps a minimum of 100 horses for himself. So David was a true representative, at least in his early years, of, of, of Yahweh. So that's the kind of king that God wanted for his people. But then when Yahweh looks at the request of these people in 1 Samuel chapter 8, you know, where they are saying, give us a king. We want to appoint a king over us to lead us. He sees, when he looks at the hearts of these people, he sees that they, they, don't, they don't really want a representative of Yahweh. They want a replacement for Yahweh. Do you see the difference? They don't want a king who will be representing Yahweh and doing what Yahweh wants. They want a king who will do whatever they want. 
so they are looking for a replacement for yahweh which is why the lord is very angry with them and he says um that you know uh, they have rejected me as their king um let's look at a couple of verses which bring out this concept actually uh, 1 samuel chapter 8 verse 18 if someone could read out 1 samuel 8 18 when that day comes you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the lord will not answer you in that day yeah you know if you were to read this in the nkjv it says you know where it brings out that hebrew wording which is used over there it says uh and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the lord will not hear you in that day the people were looking for a king for themselves someone who would serve their purposes their interests on the other hand what kind of a king did god have in mind let's look at first samuel chapter 16 verse 3 first samuel 16 verse 3 invite jesse to the sacrifice and i will show you what to do you are to anoint for me the one i indicate the lord says uh, to samuel you know this is basically when the anointing of david is supposed to happen so the lord says you are to anoint for me the one that i will indicate so the people wanted a king who would be there for them but the lord said i want a king for me who will be my representative so the motives of the people in asking for a king in first samuel chapter 8 were wrong they wanted someone who will serve their selfish purposes on the other hand the living god wanted a king who will serve his divine purposes okay so uh, which is why the lord is not pleased uh, with the request which they make so in first samuel chapter 8 verse 7 the lord clearly says they have rejected me as their king and there are two other things which the lord says you know uh, to them which, which he is very unhappy about um the next would be first samuel chapter 8 uh, verses 19 and 20 first samuel 8 19 and 20 please but the people refused to listen to samuel no they said we want a king over us then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles they want a king who will go out before them and fight their battles up to now who is the one who fought the battles yahweh, yahweh is the one who fought their battles for them but now they are saying we want a human king who will go out in front of us because we can't see yahweh with our physical eyes we are scared we want to have a human king so they are asking for a different protector they are they don't want the lord to be their protector and the lord in fact you know brings calls out this very clearly in first samuel 10 19 if we if we could have someone read out first samuel chapter 10 verse 19 but you have now rejected your god who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses and you have said no set a king over us so now present yourself before the lord by your tribes and clans so again here the lord very clearly says you have rejected your god who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities it's the lord who actually who saves you from your disasters and calamities but now you're rejecting him and you want a human king to protect you so they rejected the lord as king they rejected him as their protector they also rejected him as their provider and this is what happens in first samuel chapter 12 verses 17 to 18 uh, if if someone could read out first samuel chapter 12 verses 17 and 18 is it not wheat harvest now i will call upon the lord to send thunder and rain and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the lord when you asked for a king then samuel called upon the lord and that same day the lord sent thunder and rain so all the people stood in awe for the lord and of samuel so that was the time of the wheat harvest when they made this request and it's not good to have rain at that time because the rain will come and spoil the crops and so samuel says 
you're turning your back on the one who actually provides you with your crops and he says see this is the wheat harvest time the rain never falls at this time but you know what the lord will bring rain upon your crops now to show that he is the one who controls the crops he is the one who controls the rains he is the one who actually is the true provider and so unexpectedly even as the lord you know even as samuel calls out to the lord thunder and rain comes upon them and all the people stand over there in awe and i think finally they realize what a big mistake they have made in asking for a human king so they reject yahweh as a, as their king as their protector and also as their provider and so very sadly you know um, they had corrupt judges and then from the corrupt judges they moved into a uh, corrupt priest because eli and his sons uh, were not very um, you know committed to the lord and then from a corrupt priest now they are going to move into move to a corrupt king because saul also proves to be you know not up to the mark so it's very sad from corrupt judges to corrupt priest and now they're moving to a corrupt king and we see uh, you know this um, transition taking place in the first 15 chapters of first samuel so chapters 1 to 15 of first samuel is where we see the transition from the judges to kingship but it's not a happy kingship because you basically have Saul ruling as the king chapter 16 to 31 is where you see the contrast being drawn between Saul and David if you look at the, if you read these chapters carefully and look at the story that is there in this uh, in the, you know chapter 16 to 31 you look you see the you begin to see the character of Saul versus the character of David and there's such a contrast between these two persons and then when you enter into second samuel uh, the first 10 chapters that is basically when samuel I mean, david finally becomes uh, king and he's able to restore israel so if you were to look at the book of samuel as one single unified book the first half is this chapters 1 to 15 which talk about uh, the you know the corrupt king who has come to the throne and then when you look at the second sections first samuel's was uh, chapter 16 to 31 where you see a contrast being drawn between Saul and David and then the third portion would be the rise of David and the restoration of Israel in second samuel chapter 1 verse 10 and then we have the next three portions where you have the downfall of David and how that affected him how it affected the nation so that's the sad part so we see that even this ideal king that god chose for himself was not really up to the mark even he fell even he failed and that is when you know we see the need for a divine messiah a divine king who will not be like these human kings so david was not as bad as saul but he too did not meet the standards which god wanted for his people and so then we see uh, god beginning to talk about a uh, son of david who will come in the future and who will be able to accomplish and achieve what this human david failed to do you know so we will uh, we would be looking at all of that in our um, next class but just to look at some of the contrasts which we can draw between Saul and David you know very quickly the first main contrast that we see we see it at the battle where which takes place between the Philistines and Israelites where you have uh, Goliath coming and you know challenging the people if you notice at that time Saul is about the only one who owns an actual armor you know like the Philistines um the problem with the israelite nation at that time is that they did not own iron iron was highly expensive iron was not available so only saul had a sword and his son had a iron sword the rest of the people uh, basically had wooden you know uh, instruments so only saul is the one who possessed a proper armor and who also had a sword so obviously the people would expect their king to go and fight goliath but goliath does no you know uh, but uh, saul is afraid to do that 
and you have a person who is not even wearing an armor going over there with confidence saying that i am coming in the name of the lord not in the name of some armor or no but actually in the name of the lord so that's the first contrast that we see between saul and david so david completely trusts in the lord saul on the other hand his trust in the lord is very shaky the second contrast that we can see between these two men um on various occasions saul tries to kill david david also gets a chance to kill saul on two occasions but on both the occasions he protects saul he does not kill him he does not attack him so the second contrast is this we see that saul does whatever is convenient for himself for david too it would have been highly convenient to get rid of saul but he doesn't you know you know go after convenience he says this is the lord's anointing how can i touch him and so he refuses to harm saul even when he gets a chance to do that so that's the contrast that we see between saul and david the third really terrible thing that we see between saul and david is that uh, you know this happens in a place called nob that will be in your uh, first samuel chapter 22 uh, so the priest uh, the priests in nob are supporting david because david is in a bad state you know saul is trying to get him killed and so they try to help him they provide him with food they provide him with bread they give him a, he doesn't have a sword and he doesn't have an iron sword so they in fact give him goliath's sword so they try to help him and when saul gets to know that the, the, the priests of nob are helping david uh, he orders that the priests should all be killed i mean imagine he wants to murder people of god i mean true people of god he wants to have them murdered cold bloodedly he says to his officials and guards go and kill them because they are you know supporting david but it says over there in first samuel chapter 22 um verse uh, verse 17 in first samuel chapter 22 verse 17 it says um the but the king's officials were unwilling to raise a hand to strike the priests of the lord they feared god they got scared they thought how on earth can we kill priests what will god do to us if we if you know if we do something so evil so they refused to kill the priests and then uh, saul asks doeg the edomite to do it and doeg the edomite he kills 85 of the priests and then he goes to the town of nob he kills all the priests in the town he kills their wives their children he even kills all their cattle there's a lot of bloodshed which takes place that's the way saul treats the people of god on the other hand this one single priest who's able to escape and he runs to david for shelter and david grants him shelter you know he 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 gets protection under david so while david honored and respected the people of god saul had no respect for the people of god and um, the fourth contrast that we see all his life saul tries to fight the philistines loses again and again finally when he dies you know he dies during a battle he is fighting with the philistines on the other hand david when he fights with the philistines he gains victory we see that in second samuel chapter 5 verses 17 to 25 where it gives a description about the grand victory which david is able to have against the philistines so saul because of his attitude towards god and towards his self self you know self centeredness he turned out to be a failure a loser on the other hand david because of that loyalty which he had towards yahweh he turns into such a success uh, so these are the main contrasts which we see uh, between these two kings yeah um, there's really not time for anything more Uh, so yeah if you have any doubts or questions we can deal with that next class when we are covering uh, second samuel so yeah let's close with a word of prayer lord we thank you that your word contains so many lessons that we can learn uh, from the lives of people so lord we pray that we would be like david 
that we would be people who will honor you, fear you, respect you, and not do anything which will displease you. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would not be spineless like Saul, who only thought about himself and his own self-interests. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will not fall into that category. Enable us, O oh Lord, to imitate David in his early years, even as he expressed his complete loyalty uh, towards you. We pray, O oh Lord, that all of these things that we are reading and learning, you would remind us of these things whenever we need to apply them in our own lives and situations. Thank you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.